Great to see you all here this morning. Our regulars, maybe a couple of visitors, so that's really good. We welcome also the people who watch online. My name's Jenny, and it's great for me to be able to lead the service here today. Um, as per usual, the children will stay in for a little while, and then they'll go out to their programs. We're a bit echoey here. Um, but first of all, I want to say a big thank you for yesterday, for the working bee, as well as a few others who actually came on other days during the week to clean up and garden and do other things around our property. So perhaps a bit of a clap. <laughs> now, you may be wondering why I've got a soccer ball, but I guess you will figure that out. Because who's been watching the soccer? Yeah. Excellent. Now, my grandson and my granddaughter both play soccer. They did, weren't very happy with my old soccer ball, so they made me buy this new one. Um, so when they come to my place, they can <coughs> play soccer or take it out of the park. But it's already getting a bit worn because the two of them have great battles in my backyard. And also they love telling me every week about their matches and how they battle it out with all the teams. Now, like all good battles on the sports fields, I don't like a fight, okay? I like a battle. Uh, last night there was a battle between the netball, Australian Jamaica, yep, and the rugby, Australian New Zealand. I mean, we're not doing that in the church, thank you. Um, and the NRL, the Rabbitohs and the Sharks, okay? Um, and last night was the DWS Giants and the Swans. Giants didn't quite get there, but anyway, um, Nelly. Um, you may say, why would I barrack for the Giants? Well, when we were in WA, everyone goes for AFL. So half our town went for the Dockers, the Fremantle Dockers, and the other half went for the West Coast Eagles. When Rob and I arrived, we didn't know anything really about AFL. We thought, oh no, what are we going to do? Um, we decided, we can't go for that team because they were upset that side. Well, I can't go for that time because they're upset that side. So what will we do? And then we found out a member of our congregation, her grandson, had joined the GWS Giants. And he was from Dongra. So we thought, ah, and we both grew up in Western Sydney. Let's do that. So we built this bridge rather than taking sides and in the battle about GWS Giants. And it created great conversations. In fact, when I went to school sometimes, they said, oh, wasn't it great the Eagles won? I said, yeah, wasn't it great the Giants won? They go, who? And I said, what do you go for them, Mrs. Stubbs? Why do you go for them? And I said, because that's where I grew up. And I said, oh, what are you doing here? I said, my husband's the minister. Oh, oh that's why you're working, because he only works one day a week. <laughs> and I go, no. Oh, I'm serious, that is what they said. Um, I said, no, no, no. We're here to talk about Jesus, and then we just were able to have great conversations and build bridges with people and have relationships with them. So, um, and every week, all of us actually face battles, not sporting battles, but battles at home and battles at work, battles in our neighbourhood, battles with our health, and many other daily challenges. So today, we're going to continue to look at the Book of Numbers and the enemies the Israelites faced and how God helped them through their conflicts. So let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for bringing us here today. We pray that each of us will cast away anything that hinders us from concentrating on your word, the Bible, and in our worship. May your spirit protect us and intervene as we meet together here in community. And we ask this in our Saviour Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to two songs, <laughs> Praise the Name and Jesus Loves Me.
me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Yo! Jesus loves me when I'm good. Jesus loves me when I'm good. When I do the things I should. When I do the things I should. And He loves me when I'm bad. Good to see you all here. If you're visiting, my name's John, and I'm one of the ministry staff here. And we have got something really fun to do out at Kids of Church today, something really important. We're talking about how God is love and how, how we know that God loves us. So that song helps remind us of that as well, that Jesus loves us. So I thought we could talk about love. And in particular, talk about the things that you love. So I need some volunteers. I think I need three kid volunteers. Hmm, who should I choose? I think you three can stand there. And I will need three grown-up volunteers as well. Okay, Lorna is one. Don't make me volunteer you. <laughs> Don't make me volunteer you. Ooh. Oh, yes. I think on your birthday, it's very important to, uh, to come up. <laughs> oh. And uh, if little people need to come, they can. That's all right. I'm to accompany you. Okay, we need one more. Oh, I think. Oh, your mum. Oh, we, we're, do we're doing a mum's theme, are we? Okay. Anita, up you come. There we go. Okay, so we're going to think about the things that we love. So I'm going to give you a choice and you, I, you either put your hands on your head or behind your back. Okay, so hands on head, hands behind your back. I'll give you a choice between two things and I'll say hands on heads for this, hands behind. So we're just going to get to know you a bit. So first of all, Brussels sprouts or broccoli? Which one do you love more? Ooh, there you go. There we go. Okay, mainly broccoli. Okay, so that's what you guys are going to have for dinner every night this week. Okay, is that a good plan? Yep, okay. All right, now, I'm going to give you the choice between chocolate and ice cream. And I know there is chocolate ice cream, which is a lovely compromise. But if there wasn't actual chocolate ice cream and you had to choose between chocolate and ice cream, okay, so chocolate or ice cream which one do you love more Ooh, okay <laughs> there we go i think you like chocolate ice cream okay all right what about rugby league or soccer sometimes called football okay Ooh, we've got okay there we go oh dear i think yeah rugby league Oh, someone's finding somewhere else to live, I think, Archie. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, we'll get a bit trickier. 
Okay. Sleeping in or going to bed early? Or even both, I guess, but yeah. Yes, I thought someone would go with that. So sleeping in or going to bed early to get your right amount of sleep. Okay, nice, nice. Now, let's think about, do you like going to the movies? Seeing, so so watching a movie on the big screen or binge watching? Which one do you love more, binge watching? Lots of episodes, all in a row, or watching a movie on the big screen. Okay, there we go. I'm sure it's because you're never allowed to binge watch. I'm, I'm sure that's it. Okay. You know when you watch lots of episodes, one after the other of a TV show, Archie? That's binge watching, yeah. Okay, all righty. Now, here's a tricky one. Being a kid or being a grown-up? Which do you prefer? Which, would you, which do you love more, being a kid or being a grown-up? Mmm. Mmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right. Okay. Now, so we've got to know some of the things that you guys love. All right. So we'll give you a round of applause. Well done. Go and sit down. But when we talk about the things we love, that's different to when the Bible talks about love. We talk about the things that we love, or we say we love something, when really we just mean it's our favourite choice, or it's something that we prefer, something that we like a lot. But when the Bible talks about love, it talks about something way better than that. It talks about how God actually chooses to love us, to be with us, to be in relationship, in friendship with us. In fact, the Bible says that God is love and it's about putting everyone else first and everything that they need first before yourself. And so, in fact, it's often not about what you like and what you prefer. It's all about other people because that's the way God treated us. Because we saw in that song that Jesus loves us when we're good, but also when we're bad. And we tend to like or love the good things and not the bad things. If I'd given you the choice between Brussels sprouts and ice cream, for example, I think I know which way everyone would have gone, or most normal people anyway. <laughs> so... But when, when the Bible talks about God loving us, it's about loving no matter what, putting everything else first. And we see that most of all in Jesus. And that is what we're going to be talking more about when we head outside now. So kids at church, we're heading out to the shed with me and Kim and little kids at church, you're heading out to the cottage with Emily and Lily. So let's go, guys. What is the greatest promise someone has ever made to you? The Old Testament is full of incredible promises from God, including the greatest promise of all, that he would establish his perfect kingdom under his promised king. In the book of Matthew, displayed through a rich portrait of the person and work of Jesus Christ, God's promises find their fulfillment. What difference do these ancient promises make in our lives today? In our modern world, how can we continue to cling to God's promised King? Join us at Wollongong Women's Conference 2023, Promised, as we come face to face with God's King Jesus in the book of Matthew. Wollongong Women's Conference is always a great day as we come together as women from the Illawarra and beyond to learn from God's Word, sing and encourage one another. We hope you can join us. Okay, so women, men, you need to listen to because it might mean that you don't get your dinner cooked that night or something like that. So, um... This is really important. If you haven't signed up yet, 
There's still places. It's $70 for the day or $60 if you're a senior or on concession. So, um, and you get great food, lunch, snacks, coffee, everything. So it's a really encouraging day. And what I want to happen today is that if you're going, or you're definitely going to sign up today, um, could you please put your name on this? It'll be up the back, or I might be walking around with it, because what we do is we all go in car pool together, and then we sit together at the conference, and we eat lunch together, and we have a really wonderful time. Now, we had 26 women four years ago, 2019 before COVID, and we were the largest group from the Illawarra. Little Jeringong. So I'm wanting us to get to 27. <laughs> so we need some more women to sign up. And Lorna's just going to come up here because I'm going to ask her, why should, why should the ladies bother to go and spend a whole day in Wollongong that day? Um, well, I really enjoyed it when I went. And I think it was last year, wasn't it? And yeah. we, I enjoyed um, driving and talking to people and... Um, that's just a really nice way of getting to know people a bit better. And I remember it was about God's will and I found the talks really helpful and stimulating and, yeah, it was really good. Thank you. Okay, so that's straight from the horse's mouth. I wasn't able to go last year, but I lived in Wollongong for 25, 30 years or something. And um, the church who sort of started it, Wollongong Baptist, was my church. So it's a great conference. It reminds me of the Katoomba Women's Convention, if anyone's ever been to that, and the speakers are top class. So come along, we'll have a great day, and put your name on here. Thanks. It may be for the, for the men that you just have to cook for one less that night. Just, um, uh, just put that out there. Um, just There are a few things coming up in the next couple of weeks. So uh, just to bring to your attention, first I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who was involved in the Working Bee yesterday. Um, there are so many people here and so many people who provided food. Uh, very generous of you. So thank you so much. Um, if you get an opportunity, go into the, uh, the bathrooms. You'll see they've been painted. Uh, the, the men, the, they both need another couple of coats, but um, uh, they're on their way. So thank you so much to all the people who, who were involved in that. It's fantastic. Um, and also the people who came to the prayer meeting. We had uh, 14 of us at the prayer meeting yesterday morning, so it was really great to be able to pray together. Uh, now, so things coming up in the next couple of weeks. Next Sunday, at all three of the service, Wiki Cheng, who is the scripture teacher at Kayama High School, uh, is going to come and speak to us about Quebecet, the, the scripture teaching board, uh, and he'll be preaching in each of the services, so that'll be really fantastic, so look forward to that. Um, the week after, of course, is the, the women's conference, uh, and then the week after that is the Claire's last Sunday with us. And so uh, it's coming up really fast. Uh, so for that day, the, the plan is for us to have a, a lunch after the main, uh, after, after this service, sorry, after the 10 o'clock service. Um, so please come and join us for that. And there's also going to be dinner after the evening service that you can join us for, so uh, for those who are part of that evening service. Um, but so lunch after the, that service. Um, and a couple of things. If you'd like to send a message to the Claire's, um, rather than having a, a physical card, we're going to, um, Michelle's organising to do it electronically. So if you'd like to write a note, a message to the Claire's, if you could do that and email it to Michelle, um, that would be really good, or give it to Michelle and she can type it up. Uh, and so that would be helpful. But also, if you'd like to provide, um, put some money towards a gift for them, then please do that. Um, you can either put money in the offertory box at the back, or you can uh, just electronically deposit it and make sure you label it for the, the Claire's gift. Okay, so if you could do that, that'd be really great. Uh, and please continue to pray for them, uh, particularly for John as he searches for a, a new position uh, and for them as they think about the future. But uh, yeah, so please be praying for them. They're the big things coming up. And then of course, the week after that is Spring to Life. And so Spring to Life is coming up really soon. Uh, and so uh, keep, keep an eye and ear out. Um, advertising material will be available next weekend, I hope, uh, to give out so you can invite your friends. So please start thinking and praying about who you will invite. Maybe invite three, four, five people, um, and then hopefully some people will come to, the, to hear about Jesus. So really exciting things coming up. Um, sad things, of course, with the Claire's leaving, but, uh, but also keep those things in your diary. Thanks. We're actually going to say the Apostles' Creed together, and I find that creeds are quite important because before I was talking about battles, and in battles we need protection. And as Christians, our protection is knowing what we actually believe in. So join with me in saying the Apostles' Creed together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. On the cross he ascended into heaven. And on the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Apostolic Church, the fellowship of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life eternal. Amen. Um, as the musicians come up to the stage, I thought I might show you a few books um, because um, books actually help me um, understand things, and especially if I'm trying to find out something more deeply and I'm battling a topic with somebody or an issue with somebody. So um, I thought I'd just show you a couple from my bookshelf. This one's from John Lennox and it's called Gunning for God. Some of you may have seen John Lennox on um, ABC when he's been in Australia on um, Q&A. And this one actually gives, answers a few questions about um, atheism, which is what he really likes to focus on. Um, also about miracles being fantasy. And people, when they sort of ask about, really, Jesus rose from the dead. So those sorts of things are in this book here. Um, Another one here is Science and God, and it's from um, the little black book series. And the um, question here is, why did God create other galaxies and planets? Hmm. That's always a bit of a question um, when we seem just to focus on us here on Earth. And a final one just for this section is for those who um, prefer pictures in their books. Okay, This one is Amazing Grace. I actually really like... Um, biographies. So this is about William um, Wilberforce, Amazing Grace, and also it's about his battle to end slavery. I mean, don't let the size put you off, um, but it is um, a really encouraging read as well. So let us sing When I Survey.
decisions come back down. I've just got another two books. This one um, I've got is from John Dixon, Hanging In There. Um, when I was teaching Penrith Anglican College, we actually um, shared this book with the children and the teenagers particularly, and it was really good for them about for their protection and them knowing where they would stand as a Christian. Um, and just one chapter is about getting the most out of the Bible. What about prayer? There's one about missionary dating. That's when you have a relationship with a non-Christian. Um, and Bible bashing, how not to Bible bash. So um, I'm happy for you to borrow any of these books. Um, and this, this book at the moment that I've been reading is called Battle Ready. Uh, train your mind to conquer challenges, defeat doubt, and live victoriously. I can't lend this to you because as you can see my bookmarks in there, I'm still reading it. Um, but I'll just read you a bit of the intro. This book is dedicated to everyday warrior women. The one crying out in pain, the one shaving her head due to cancer, the one with marriage hanging by a thread, the one suffering through an onslaught of mean words, the one trying to lift her head again, the one hoping to beat her nightly drinks, the one who calls herself a bad mum, the one pleading for a lost loved one, the one whose past beats her up, the one who goes to church that still feels lonely, the one who uh, does um, things wrong, and if this is you and me, regular women fighting the good fight. So it's taken me a little while to get through this. So, um, but when I do finish, um, if you're interested in that or any of the others, just ask me after the service. Um, we're going to have our Bible readings now, and Graham and Paul, and then Steve's going to come and share from the Bible and do our prayer time. Thank you. Our first reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 2. It's the letter of the Lord Jesus to the church in Pergamum. And uh, he warns them about the teaching of Balaam, who we'll hear about more of as we hear from the uh, second reading in uh, Numbers. Revelation 2, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, the second reading is the Numbers chapter 22, starting verse 21 and reading to the end of the chapter. Uh, Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat her to get her back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on either side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. 
When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared her. <coughs> Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at Moabat town, sorry, Moabat town on the Arnon border at the edge of his territory. Balak said to Balaam, Did I not send you an urgent summons? Why didn't you come to me? Am I really not able to reward you? Well, I have come to you now, Balaam replied, but can I say just anything? I must speak only what God puts in my mouth. Then Balaam went with Balak to Kiriath Huzot. Balak sacrificed sheep and cattle and gave some to Balaam and the princes who were with him. The next morning, Balak took Balaam up to Bamoth Baal, and from there he saw part of the people. Hi again. Um, that was funny reading, hey? Um, you ever feel like you're kind of walking in halfway through a story? Um, well, we certainly are. And we've got a few visitors here this morning. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, you actually walked in, the, in halfway through a story that we've been following over the last uh, few weeks. We were looking at a book in the Old Testament called Numbers. Um, and uh, we'll get to there in a moment, but before we do, I'm going to pray for us uh, and we'll pick up the story um, of where, where we're up to. Let's, let's look at it. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to be here together today. We thank you for the chance to, to meet together, to, uh, to pray, to sing, um, to hear your word. And Lord, we ask Lord, now that as we ponder what you've written in, your, in scriptures, that you would help us to understand it, um, understand it so it might encourage us and strengthen us, but also so that we might uh, follow you uh, all the more closely. So we pray that you would be with us now. Help me to speak truly and clearly, and uh, Lord, we come away from here uh, better equipped to love and serve you this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, you may have sensed a bit of a theme coming through the service so far today, particularly with Jenny's uh, things that she's been saying, doing a grand job. Thank you, Jen, for, the, for that. Um, but uh, the whole idea of battles. I don't know if you've ever been in a battle. Um, I've never been. I think I'd be really scared to be in a battle. Like, the kind of battles that we think about, the kind of battles I've been part of are going to football games. Like, wow, how scary is that? Um, uh, sometimes when you're playing against a really big team that's kind of winning the league and defeating everyone, it's a bit scary. But uh, but never really been really scared about having to go into a battle. Um, perhaps if I was preaching this to another generation, that they would be able to tell me what it was like to go into battle and uh, that kind of thing. We don't kind of have that so much anymore, though that certainly does happen around the world. Um, I wonder how you feel about the idea of having enemies or going into a battle. Um, now, I, I think it would be pretty scary. But it's also, of course, there's not just big battles that we fight in our life, are we? Are there? Um, there are other uh, battles that we fight. Remember that introduction that Jenny read from that book um, highlighted some of the battles that, that uh, not just women, but of course women and, and men face. Uh, the battles of things like alcoholism or abuse uh, and just the, the many battles that come against our lives. 
Uh, and how do you feel when you're, when you're approached or when you're faced with one of those kind of battles? Um, you can feel anxious. You can feel scared. What do you do when you feel that way? Well, in today's passage, I hope you'll, you'll uh, be encouraged uh, if you're facing one of those things or in the future if you come against those kind of battles, uh, but also to recognise that actually, whether we know it or not, we're all in a battle. Uh, and so we'll see why, that, why that's the case in a minute. So let's turn to the book of Numbers. Uh, just a reminder of where we've been. You remember that God has, has brought the, his people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. For those of you who have seen the, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston or Prince of Egypt, you've seen the, the movie, you've seen it being brought out, uh, parting the Red Sea, all of that. And God took them down to Mount Sinai. We gave them the Ten Commandments. But that was really just a pit stop along the way to go to the Promised Land. Many years before, he promised through uh, the person Abraham that he would bring him into this land. And so he got them there in chapter 14 of the book of Numbers. But when they got there, they didn't go in. Why didn't they go in? Can some other people who have been here tell us why they didn't go in? Because the people were scary. They were afraid. They saw... The, the fact that they'd seen God kind of part seas and you know, pillars of cloud and all that kind of stuff and fire didn't kind of influence them. They just saw people who looked a bit big and they thought they had no chance. They were afraid. And because they didn't trust God to take him to the land, he said, all right, because you don't trust me, you won't go into the land. Your children will. And so for the next 40 years, you're going to wander around the desert uh, until that whole generation dies out. And then the next generation will be able to go into the promised land. And so that's where we were. Um, and since that time where they refused to go in, they've come across a, a, a number of enemies. As you read through the book, uh, they uh, re read through the rest of the book of Numbers, they come across a number of different enemies. And they have kind of a mixed bag of results. So the first enemies they, get, they go against are in chapter 14. When God has said you can't go in, they decide, oh, we'll go in anyway. And so they, go, they try to go into the promised land, but the Canaanites and the Malachites just wipe the floor with them and they get defeated. A number of people die in the battle. Um, a little bit later on, chapter 20, so a few chapters down, um, they come to the uh, nation of Edom, and it's a big, strong nation. They, they figure, we don't want to fight with you because we're going somewhere else. Uh, can we go through? And they're like Gandalf. They stand and they go, no, you shall not pass. And so they have to kind of, they have to change direction and go around. They could all go all the way around uh, the, the nation of Edom. But then they come across another nation, and the, the king of that nation, a guy, the king of Arad, he kind of maybe is emboldened by the fact that the Edomites um, stood up against them. And so he says, well, we're going to go into battle against you. And so they go to fight. But f finally, for once, the, the Israelites actually call out to God. This is in chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. They cry out to God, and God rescues them, and they actually win the victory. They win the battle. And the same thing happens a little bit later in the chapter, in uh, verses 21 to 26. Um, the Amorites come out to, be, to attack them, and they defeat them as well. In fact, they, they settle in the, the land of the Amorites for a while. Uh, while they're there, another guy uh, by the name of Og, who's obviously really angry because somebody's given him the name Og, um, Anyway, he's the king of Bashan, and he decides to come and attack them as well. Because you remember, this is a, a large group of people we're talking about here. Two million people, 600,000 warriors, and he's afraid. And he says, well, I'm going to come and attack you before you attack me. Uh, but again, uh, God helps them to defeat, defeat them. And so by the time he gets to, to Numbers chapter 22, 40 years has passed, give or take. And in chapter 22, verse 1, you find them... Um, settled in the land across the river from the city of Jericho. So they're across the river from the promised land. And they're, we're kind of there going, this is exciting. Are we going to get to go in now? Are they going to, what's going to happen this time? Will, the, will they be afraid again? Will their enemies um, defeat them? Uh, what's going to happen? Well, uh, before they get to go into the promised land, there's still a few other things that are going, going to happen. And the first one happens in verse 20, chapter 22, because as they're sitting there waiting to go into the promised land, another king um, by the name of Balak, the king of the Ammonites, not to be confused with the Amorites, but the Ammonites, um, he sees this vast horde of people sitting on his doorstep. And he figures, we've got a problem here. I, I, there's nothing I can do about it. They've defeated the really big kings like, oh, he's a really powerful king. They've defeated him. What chance have I got? And so he says, well, we can't beat them in battle. We've got to try something else. And so Balak comes up with a brilliant idea. 
Rather than going into a military battle, he decides to have a spiritual battle. He decides um, to call in the spiritual big guns. He calls for a guy by the name of Balaam or Balaam. I'll call him Balaam today, why not? Um, Balaam. And now we don't, we've never heard of Balaam apart, unless you've read this story. Uh, and to us, he means nothing. However, in, in that day, he was quite famous. In fact, uh, archaeological re- records have been dug up. Um, not one from outside the Bible that talk about Balaam and how how he was a really powerful kind of religious influencer. So we talk about social influences in our world. Well, he was a religious influence, influencer. If you wanted something, if you wanted the gods to do something for you, this is the guy to get. And he's like a prophet for hire. He's not um, he's not one of the Israelites. He's a he's a pagan prophet, um, but he's got this reputation that he's built up over the years. That uh, if you get him in and he can pray for you or whatever it might he does, the divination that he does, he goes through the rituals. Then you're you're going to go well in in battle because the gods will be on your side, and that's why Balak calls for him. He's 400 kilometres away, so he sends some envoys to go and get him, uh, and obviously he takes the fee with him. The the you know the you know, the uh, Profit fee, whatever it is. Um, I mean, he's in it for profit, I don't know. But um, it seems that he is, actually, because when he gets there, uh, he says, well, looks, okay, I'll, I'll come, but I'll, but I'll just got to find out what's gonna, what I'm going to do first. And so he actually says, stay the night, and overnight I'll talk to the gods and see what happens. That night, something amazing happens. God does speak to this pagan prophet. And he says to him in chapter 22, verse 12, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. Oh, Balaam's got a bit of a problem. He's got this potential payday here and a pretty rich one. Uh, what am I going to do? Well, I can't go. So I, he just says, oh, look, I can't go with you. I'm sorry. And so the envoy has to go, track the 400 kilometres back to Balak and say, sorry, uh, Balak, uh, he won't come. And Balak is furious. Come on, look, you know, I'm, I'm a big and important man here. Um, I'm not going to take no for an answer. So he sends another invoice, some more distinguished people with more money because he thinks maybe this is like a, a negotiation tool uh, that you know you say, initially say no and then they have to come back with more money. And so he figures, well, that's going to be the case. So I'll send some more distinguished people and a bit more money and ask him to come again. And so that's what he does. He sends the people, they go to him. Uh, and again, Balaam does the same thing. He says, just wait, and I'll find out what happens. And overnight, again, God says, well, this time he says, go with them, but do only what I tell you. You can imagine, Balaam's feeling pretty happy. Oh, that's good, I've got this potential payday. Now I can do it. Obviously, this God's changed his mind. I can go there and do the, whatever the curse needs to be done, and everything will be okay. And so the next day, he, he sets off. And if you read in the New Testament, Balaam is actually mentioned there a couple of times. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, it su- suggests that at, at the heart of what Balaam's wanting is the payday. Um, you can see 2 Peter 2.16 suggests that it's, it's greed that makes him want to go because a huge amount of money has been offered to him. And so off he goes. But as he goes, God is angry with him, which I think is a little bit weird because God said to go, but it seems that God knows what's going on in ba- Balaam's heart. Um, something that we don't see. And so God sends an angel to stop him. And uh, what ensues is, is almost comical. It sounds like it's out of Shrek, basically, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Shrek. Um, and it's, it's, it's fascinating because uh, this spiritual guru can't see this spiritual being that's right in front of him. This spiritual seer has no sight, but his donkey does. And so as he's riding along on his donkey, I don't know if there are people with him, we're not told, but he's riding along on his donkey, um, the angel of the Lord appears to him and draws his sword ready to lop off Balaam's head and the donkey says, well, I've got to protect him. And so he, 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 the donkey, she, I believe it says in the scriptures, um, takes him off the path. And because Balaam can't see what's in front of him, he gets cranky and so he gets his stick out. Pesky animal. Uh, never work with children or animals. And so he finally gets it back on the road and uh, plodding along. And then they, again, the angel of the Lord appears. Again, Balaam doesn't see it. And so the, the path is a little bit narrower. So it's like running down those country lanes you see in, in the UK with the brick walls down the side. And so the, the donkey can't kind of go off into the field. So it kind of goes along the side and squashes his foot against the thing and gets his stick out. And so you can imagine kind of the 21st or the 12th century BC road rage happening. 
And so finally he gets back on the, ro- back's on the road and, and they come to a very narrow pass and again the angel of the Lord stands there, dr- sword drawn, ready to, ready to lop off Bala- uh, Balaam's head and the donkey goes, well, I've got nowhere to go, so he just sits. If you've ever taken a dog for a walk, it doesn't go for a walk, it's just like that. It's like he's dead weight behind you. Uh, and so you can imagine Bal- how cranky Balaam is by this point. It's the third time, he gets off his donkey, he's, like, he's waxing, the, waxing the animal, trying to get it going. God, I told you. And uh, then something incredible happens. And so it's, it's like it comes straight out of Shrek because God opens the donkey's mouth uh, and starts to speak. And his, his, his message uh, is very simple. He says, Balaam, what did I ever do to you? Why are you betting me like this? <laughs> I'm not going to try and do the voice. I'm not going to try and do the voice. It would just be wrong. So many levels. Um, I'm not going to try to do it. Um, although I do like parfait. Anyway. Uh, no, I'm not going to do it. Uh, anyway, so the doggy speaks. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And I, I love the fact that Balaam doesn't blink an eyelid about this donkey talking to him. He says, look, well, look, you, you, you made me, you've hurt my foot and you made me look like a fool. You made me look like an idiot. What are you doing to me? And the donkey says, look, Balaam, well, have I ever done this to you before? You know, like I've been your donkey for a long time. You know, have, have I ever done, maybe there's a reason. Um, and finally, God opens uh, Balaam's eyes as he opened the donkey's uh, mouth. And he sees in front of him the the angel of the Lord with his sword ready to lop his head off and he just falls down to the ground. He says, oh no, I'm in huge trouble here. And the angel speaks and reveals why God uh, is angry with him. He says, I've come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before you. Yes, God has said to go, but it seems that as he's going, Balaam, there's something in in Balaam's heart or intentions that is going to go against what God has told him to do. God knows. And that's one of the things about God. He knows us better than we know ourselves, really. Uh, we're not told exactly what's going on in Balaam's mind, but God clearly knows it. And so Balaam says, well, okay, well, do you want me to go back again? Do you want me to turn around and go back? Is that what you want? No, he says, well, now I want you to go. You might as well go, but say only what I, mean, I, want you to, I tell you to say. Okay, Make sure you only say what I tell you to say. Now, Balaam is no fool. He realises, well, I've been warned, and I'm going to do If only the Israelites were like that, right? But anyway, I've been warned, and so I'm going to do the right thing. So he goes, and he meets Balak. And so that um, passage we had from chapter 22, um, oh, we, we just, after that, that happens, he, he meets Balak at the very end. And uh, when he gets there, Balak's going, fantastic. Look, I don't know why he took so long. Look, you know, I'm an important guy. I've got time, can't, no time to waste. Why are you waiting around? But anyway, you're here now. So if you could just curse these people for me, that would be really great. So Balaam says, all right, well, what I'll do is I'll, if you could set up seven altars, and on each of the altars I want you to sacrifice a bull and a ram. Okay, so this is no small thing that's going on here. I want you to do all this, and then after that I'll say what God tells me to say. I can't do, it, do anything else. So Balaam says, okay, sure, no worries, let's, let's go for it. And so they do that, and then Balaam speaks. And in uh, chapter 23, verse 8, we hear what he says. How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? From the rocky peaks I see them, from the heights I view them, I see people who live apart and do not consider themselves one of the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or even a fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous. May my final end be like theirs. He sees the Israelites and he goes, these, people, these are people who are blessed by God. How can I possibly curse them? They're going to they're gonna have a great end. They're not going to have a cursed end. They're going to have a, a blessed end. Now, if you're Balak and you've sent for this guy, 400 kilometres he's come, he's been backwards and forwards, and now he comes up, you do all this sacrificing, how do you feel? Pretty cranky, right? He's furious. He says, well, you obviously don't understand the depth of the problem. And so he says, let's, let's move to a different location so you can get a better view of these people. And so they travel, they traipse along to a different, so they get a different view of the, of the people of Israel. And he looks out over them and Balaam says, okay, we'll build another seven altars. So they do the same thing again, seven altars, all the different animals being sacrificed. And then I'll say what God tells me to say. This is what he says uh, in chapter 23, verses 21 to 24. No misfortune is seen in Jacob, no misery observed in Israel. Their Lord, their God, is with them. 
The shout of the king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. There is no divination against Jacob, no evil omens against Israel. It will now be said of Jacob and of Israel, see what God has done. The people rise like a lioness. They rouse themselves like a lion that does not rest until it devours its prey and drinks the blood of its victims. Gruesome. Anyway, um, basically what he's saying is these people are, going, are not going to be cursed. They're going to be blessed. Why? Because God is with them. Their God is with them. And he's the one who brought them out of Egypt. He's the one who gives them strength. So how can they possibly be cursed? How can I curse them? I can't because God is with them. Now, Balak's not very pleased by that. That's not what I paid you to do. Let's go somewhere else. Let's try one more time. Yeah, obviously not learning his lesson yet. Anyway, so he goes, so they go to a third location where they get this great view of all of the Israelites and they look out and he says, right, build the seven altars. They do all that. They do all the, the, the kind of things that you need to do for divination in those days. And so, right, Balaam, now you've got to curse them. And so in chapter 24, verses 5 onwards, we hear his, um, what he says. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, Israel. Like valleys they spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets. Their, their seed will have abundant water. Their, their king will be greater than Agag. Their kingdom will be exalted. God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. They devour hostile nations and break their bones in pieces. With their arrows they pierce them, like a lion they crouch and lie down, like a lioness who dares rouse them. May those who bless you be blessed, and those who curse you be cursed. So Balak has brought Balaam there to, to curse these people, but he does the exact opposite. He blesses them. They are blessed by God. In fact, perhaps unknowingly, he actually quotes God. Back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God says, um, I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God is fulfilling his promises to Abraham from all those years before, and no one and nobody is going to stand in his way. God's blessing will fall on his people. And no battle, physical or spiritual, is going to stand in the way. It's actually something really important for us to remember, don't you think? Um, and we'll get back to that in a moment. So they've been in spirit, physical battles and uh, they've, they've been victorious. What's been happening here is a spiritual battle. This is something that the Israelites have, are completely oblivious to. They haven't seen any of this because they're just sitting in the valley doing, doing whatever they're doing, looking after their sheep and their goats and that kind of stuff. And this battle, this spiritual battle has been going on. Balak thought, if I could bring in the spiritual heavyweights, then they will win. Then I'll win. But they, even they have been defeated. But there's one more enemy that the Israelites are going to face. There's one more trick up Balaam's sleeve. And this time it's a not-so-spiritual warfare. In chapter 25, he brings in the ladies. Uh, chapter 25. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women, who invited them to the sacrifice to their gods, to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. Um, we find uh, in uh, chapter 31, this is actually uh, Balaam's idea, that he tried to, tried to curse the Israelites, but God wouldn't let him because God is on their side. Well, maybe we could try and turn that around by by turning them against their God. If God is wanting to bless them, if we can turn them against God, well then maybe, uh, uh, Balak, you've got a chance. And so he sends in the women. And they're, they're not just any women, they're people from uh, their temple worship. Um, and in many, in many cultures in, those, in that time, um, sexuality was a huge part of it. And so they would have like temple prostitutes um, who would go, and people would be, that would be part of your worship or part of your ritual. And so they figure, let's go and send in, see how the Israelite men go. And of course, like sadly, like so too many men, they just so easily give in. Um, and what's worse? What's worse than just the adultery, like the fact that they they married men who are going to commit adultery in this way? What's worse than that is their spiritual adultery. 
Because they don't just go to have sex with these women, they actually go to worship their gods. And so they actually turn their back on the God who has brought them out of Egypt. They've actually been re they're rejecting him and following them now. And so it's not su no surprise that God is angry. His anger burns against them. And so from that moment, God says to, to Moses, send people out and kill everybody who's done, who's done this. This cannot stand amongst God's people. And a plague uh, comes. And to give you an idea of the scope of it, some 24,000 people die. To give you an idea of how many people were involved in this. This was no secret. This is not something done in, the, in a kind of backwater. This was blatant. In fact, in one incident, a man parades a Midianite woman straight past Moses' eyes and takes her into his tent. That's how brazen they were, um, how committed they were to this. And this plague continues until this, a guy by the name of Phineas, um, who's one of Aaron's descendants, um, is so incensed by this that he actually takes a spear and follows that guy into the tent and spears both him and, and his lover uh, through the two of them. Um, gruesome stuff. For 40 years, they've uh, been through snakes, they've been through fires, they've been through sinkholes, they've been through plagues, they've been through all sorts of things. And now that whole generation is gone. God kept his promise to them. They refused to go into the promised land and now they've all been wiped out. And so the book actually changes tone from after this story. So in chapter 26, there's a second census. So you remember there's one at the beginning. They were the ones who'd come out. A, 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 a census was taken of the number of people who came out of a land who were going to go into the promised land, came of Egypt and were going to the promised land. And well, now all of those are gone. And so they take a second census, which shows this is the new generation that's going in. And interestingly, it's almost exactly the same number of people. That, uh, that, that generation has been wiped out, but actually they've just been replaced. And so this new generation is going to go in. God's going to bless them. And the rest of the book is really about um, what's going to be like as they go in and talks about who's going to live where and all those kinds of things. And you can read through the rest of the book. Uh, it will describe uh, what, what they're going to do as they go into the prompt land. God's now going to prepare them to go in. So what do we do with all this? Like this is all very interesting. We love the story of the Shrek part uh, with the donkey talking. It's all fantastic and funny. But what, what does it do? what's it mean for us? Well, I think there's two things that I want to quickly just touch on. First one is this. Uh, back in Numbers 24, when Balaam is blessing Israel, he gives a clue as to when this blessing will happen. You may remember last week we, we saw that the clue, one of the clues for understanding the Old Testament, how it applies, is how does it point towards Jesus? I wonder if you can see Jesus in this. This is in uh, Numbers 24, verse 17. Uh, Balaam says, I see him, the Lord Almighty, he says, I see the Lord, uh, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab and sc the skulls of the people of Sheth. Edom will be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered, but Israel will grow strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. I wonder who he's talking about there. He sees a, a, a king rising out of Jacob, out of the people of Israel. Who is that king? For the next few hundred years, they're waiting and they're waiting for this king. Even after the great King David and King Solomon, they're still waiting for that king. The promised king who will bring the ultimate blessing and will defeat the enemies of God. He's talking about Jesus, of course. Jesus is that king who rises up out of Israel. Out of Israel. Um, he is the fulfilment of these promises. These promises actually lead us straight to him. Uh, and so as we think about our world, and we think about um, perhaps the battles that we fight, it's important for us to realise that they, our, our battles have been fought and won in the same way that Israel's battle was fought and won and they didn't even know it. This battle between Balak and, uh, and Balaam and God. Our battle has been won when Jesus died and rose again. He's defeated all the, the spiritual powers. And so we don't need to be afraid. When we look at the things that will come up in our lives, we can actually trust that God is with us, that this promise of blessing will come to us. We, we will have to go through difficulties in life, that's, that's assured. But the blessing cannot be taken away from us. Jesus' death and resurrection is an assurance of that. 
You don't need to be afraid that anything can take you, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What a great promise that is. So the first thing to take away from this passage is to remember that our battle has been won. It's been won by Jesus. Having said that, um, it's important for us to realise that we're actually still part of a battle. Now, of course, we're not part of battles in the same way that the Israelites are. And sometimes I think Christians, particularly in other places that I won't mention, um, get con- confuse this. That we, 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 are in, like, we, we should be in like military battles. But we don't do that anymore. We're not in a military battle. We don't take up swords or spears or AK-47s in the same way that they did. In fact, when you read the New Testament, it's quite the opposite. Jesus says, not attack your enemies, but love your enemies. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. There will be enemies, but love them. You will be persecuted, but love them anyway. And go the extra mile for them. That, that um, picture of going the extra mile is actually literally when your enemy that gets you to take their, carry their kit for them, don't just carry it one, carry it another mile. Go the extra mile. Love more than, you expect, than you're expected to love. Keep on giving love. That love that John talked about earlier. That love that is giving. And of course, uh, we, we go even further than that, of course, because uh, we have something that, that, that they need. And that's why the, the last command of Jesus is that you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That you have something that the world needs. And so far from having enemies in the world... We actually are, are, are to love the world, to conquer the world, not with, uh, with arms, but with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus. That's, that's what we, how we are to approach our world that may set itself up against us. But also having said that, we need to realise that as we do that, we are part of a battle. It's a spiritual battle. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul, you'll remember, many of you will remember, uh, says this. Ephesians 6 verse 12, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Uh, The Israelites didn't see the battle they were in, but we should not miss the battle we are in, a spiritual battle. Peter says that your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's you. You are in a battle. You don't have to be afraid because our battles have been won. But he also will continue, we'll need to, to uh, continue the skirmishes until Christ returns. And often the devil will use the same kind of weaponry he used back then. And so for all those Israelite men who fell to sexual immorality, look, the devil is not very original. He keeps using the same weapons. So that, second, that reading we have from Revelation 2 is a letter to a church that's falling in the same way. They're falling into the same temptations of Balaam that the people from Numbers 25. And you still see it, of course, if the the Royal Commission has taught us anything, it's that the church is still um, vulnerable to this kind of attack. And so as God's people, we need to be ready to stand. We need to be ready to stand, not with the um, physical weapons, but with the spiritual weapons that Paul again lays out for us. The spiritual armour of truth of a life of righteousness, the readiness to talk about Jesus, to share our faith, the knowledge of salvation, um, trust in God, the word of God and prayer. These are the weapons that we need for our spiritual battle. So don't be afraid about what the world might throw at you uh, because all, all these things have been defeated because of Christ. We can trust that that blessing is for us. However, don't be naive don't think that everything will just go along swimmingly for us so we won't ever have to worry again. We're in a battle, um, a battle that is won through Jesus, but one that we need to fight nonetheless. Um, so let me pray that God would help us to do just that. And in fact, I'm going to move into a time of prayer straight after that. So we'll pray and then I'll continue in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the one who has defeated all evil. Through his death and resurrection, he has given us life. And so, Lord God, we ask that you would uh, fulfil your promise to us and bring those blessings. We look forward to the day when Christ will come and take us home. In the meantime, Lord, help us to fight. Help us to fight with spiritual armour. Lord God, may we stand firm in our faith and push forward uh, into new territory with the gospel so that more and more people might come to know you 
they might be brought into your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I'm going to leave this in prayer, but um, I'm going to use the uh, ministry prayer points that were printed off for yesterday's prayer meeting. And so I'm just going to bring up a few things that were in there. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look forward to spring to life in a few weeks' time. And so we want to bring before you the different activities that are happening there. We pray for the Seniors Expo. We pray for the Men and Meat meeting down at the Stoic Brewery. We pray for the Women's Wellbeing uh, meeting. And we pray for the Community Family Fair. Uh, and finally, we also pray for the chalkboard questions. Lord, we ask that for each of those things, um, that you would bring people uh, who are ready to hear the good news of Jesus. Father, uh, we can't do anything without you, and all the organisation and planning that we undergo uh, is worthless without you. And so we submit all of these things to you. Give us courage and strength to invite our family and our friends to come and hear about Jesus. Prepare them, we pray, so that when they, when they come, they might respond with faith. Lord, we also want to give thanks for the Clare family, for the amazing ministry they've had here for many years. We thank you for their love, for their encouragement and their teaching. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that you'll be with them as they prepare to move. Um, give them comfort as they have to say goodbye, and particularly for those who are closest to them. And we do pray for John, that you would lead him to his next position, next ministry position, where he can serve you uh, as he has done here. Once they've gone, Lord, we pray for the children and youth ministries. We pray particularly for the teams that are in place or being gathered uh, to take on the different ministries that John was involved in. Uh, we pray for uh, junior drivers. We pray for insight uh, and for kids at church. We pray for those people that you give each of them time uh, and energy and resources they need um, for those ministries to continue to flourish and grow. Father, we want to pray for the pastoral care in our church. We thank you for our pastoral care team who meets um, each week um, to pray for those who aren't, uh, or we haven't seen at church for a while. We pray, Lord, that you might bring new people into that team and that it might be effective in following up and caring for people uh, who are in need in our church. Uh, we pray for those outside our church. We pray particularly for the schools. Uh, we pray for the Christian schools uh, at NAC and at SAC, but also for Kayama High and uh, Jeringong uh, Public. We pray particularly for the Year 12 students as they do their trial HSC exams um, and pract practical exams for dance and drama and music, those kinds of things. Um, give them a clear head. Um, help them to find their comfort and their strength in you uh, during those difficult times. And Lord, we also want to pray for those outside of our church. We thank you so much for those who take the gospel out to our world on our behalf. And so we pray for Simon and Jess Cow. We thank you for their time with us. Uh, we pray that you'll be with them in, uh, just in their, their remaining weeks as they visit their supporter churches. Um, please encourage them. Please be with the kids as they get um, dragged around from one place to the other. Uh, we pray, Lord, that they would, be, they would go back strengthened and encouraged, that you would raise up new supporters for them uh, so they don't have to worry about the financial issues. Uh, we pray that you would really bless them as they go back into their ministries. We pray for Andrew and Beck serving in the Middle East. We pray for wisdom and grace in their relationships there that they might be able to be salt and light in that context. Uh, we pray for James and Brittany Damon, Lord, that you would give them wisdom as they reach out, particularly to the miners um, who are either asleep or down the mines, um, and it's hard to connect with them. We pray that you would show them how they might reach particularly to those people. Uh, we pray also for Pastor Brendan Garlett down in, at Shoalhaven Aboriginal Community Church. Uh, we pray that you would guide his decisions, particularly uh, with the funeral that he's going to be conducting later this month. We pray for Anglicare. We thank you particularly for those in our church who are involved um, bringing food uh, to the mobile food pantry. Uh, we give you thanks for the opportunity that they have um, to share the gospel uh, and practical help for those in need. And so we pray, Lord, that that may be able to continue and that you might make it effective. We pray for Tumani Ministries in Kenya. We pray for peace and safety amongst all the protests that are happening at the moment. We give you thanks for the answers to prayer, but we continue to pray that that work may go forward for the churches that are planted and for the pastors who are growing in their knowledge of you. May they have a deep uh, foundation upon which to build their churches. We pray for Wiki. We thank you that he's able to come next week and we look forward to hearing what you're doing there. We, we pray uh, in advance for the One Music Festival in November. We pray for the money that they need, uh, that uh, the sponsor will be found that is needed to keep the ticket prices affordable. And we pray for patrons and volunteers uh, and that it will be an, an opportunity for Christians to get together and non-Christians too to come and hear great music uh, and to hear the good news of Jesus. 
And finally, we want to pray for the Anglican aid. We give you thanks for Zambia's Child and the Apollo Christian School. Uh, we thank you for that, uh, for the staff who want to uh, teach the, ch the children, help them to grow up to know and to love you, uh, and, and also to make a difference in, that, in their town. And so we pray, Lord, that, that, that they might uh, continue to, uh, to work through uh, adult education and through the children as they grow up and, and graduate uh, to make a difference in their community. Lord, there are so many things that we want to bring before you. And we know that in all of these things, you are in control. You are the Lord. You are the King. And so we submit our thoughts and our hopes and our dreams to you, asking that you would work in and through us uh, and all these people for your glory. Let's finish off the Lord's, uh, our prayer time by praying the Lord's prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As the musicians come up on the stage, I've just got two slides to look at. Um, and these are just so we can focus and reflect on protection in the battle. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. So remembering that we're protected by knowing and reading the Bible. And the second one that's up there is by praying. Um, we are protected in the battle as we meet in prayer as well. So join um, with our musicians. We're going to sing Living Hope.
Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. He's the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Has broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. As we remain standard, yes, hallelujah, Jesus is our living hope. Uh, today, if you would like prayer, um, David Broadley's Stay down the front. I'm staying in the front. We can pray out the front, Barbara. Okay. Any prayers. Um, and we'll find somewhere else on the property to play with you. On the back blackboard, there's these great words that I like to finish with. Uh, it's from number 624. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. So, join us for morning tea. We're staying inside today and the tables are coming down the middle. Mm -hmm. 